That's terrible lighting. Whatever, we'll roll with it. So in today's video, we're here to upgrade... What's the Scott 30 Free Tube FM Philharmonic doing here? Get out of there! So what we're here to do is upgrade the picture tube in this Zenith portal. <clears throat> I got this set ages and ages ago at the second ETF swap meet I ever attended. Uh, I think it was back around 2011 or 2012, something like that, back when I was in college. Mark Mason and Nick Williams together helped me bring the picture tube that was in it at the time back to life. A few years ago I got another picture tube for it that also wasn't terribly terrific. Um, basically all the tubes I've had for it so far have been on the weak side. Let me just power the thing up and show you. That's shrunken, and that's portal zoom that fills the screen. You see if portals allowed you to switch between a regular aspect ratio or a stretched picture, depending on whether you wanted to fill the porthole or not. I think the very dim lighting in here and the dim picture, even with brightness cranked up, helps convey just how weak the picture tube in this set is. I'm running this on a brightener. Oh yeah! That's right. Someone gave me a good idea. Before we change this picture tube out, let's see how many brighteners we can run this picture tube on. That ought to be fun. We already got one on the set, and I know I've got a bag of them somewhere. Looks like there are additional brighteners in here. I know I've got other... Oh yeah, I got three more up here. All the brighteners. Dedicated porthole cheater cord and extension cord. But Tom, it's not a proper cheater cord if it has a normal outlet plug on the end. A proper cheater cord has the correct pins to go between the back of the TV and the interlock on the chassis like this. Fair enough. I know I've got another one of these somewhere that also has the uh, standard small pin interlock that later sets into the uh, 80s used. I don't know where it is right now. Okay, what I'm going to try to do is get in here and put a couple of test leads onto the heater pins of the picture tube. And those are on either side of the keyway right here. Spin it around until I've got a couple loops around each pin. Smash them as far back as they'll go so that they won't interfere with installing the socket. And this will let me see what the voltage on the picture tube is as I increase the number of brighteners. We already had one brightener on it to get that picture quality out of it. Let's temporarily unhook that and show you what she looks like with just the regular 6.3 volts it should get. And I'll grab a meter so that we can show that 6.3 volts. Uh, I don't know. I wonder if you can see it up here or not. Eh, whatever. We'll hook it up. Okay. Now, plug in our cheater cord. Uh, 
Okay. We have 6.2-ish volts. It's wavering around a little bit. This is without the brightener installed as a baseline. Come on. Well, I know this is a dumb place to set it, but can you humor me? either. Okay, so with about 6.2 volts on the heater right now, that's how dim the picture is. So let's jam another, or let's jam the first brightener back on and see where that gets us. So, chassis off. Base off. Uh, so right now our brightener voltage is 7.4 volts. So that's warmed up. Horizontal is finicky about locking after warm up. Okay, let's grab another brightener here. This one's configured for parallel heaters. Some of these brighteners you actually have to configure them for series or parallel heaters. And some brighteners don't actually increase the voltage but instead isolate the heater of the tube from the uh, transformer windings to alleviate heater cathode shorts that happen. So, here goes brightener number two. Ow, I'm gonna unplug this just because I'm concerned about potential high voltage coming off the base pins. I don't think that normally happens on Good picture tubes that I've seen there on gassy picture tubes. And it has me gun shy. So there's two brighteners in series. I am not seeing an increase, a significant increase at least, in the heater voltage over before. I didn't even have to touch the control this time. It locked in. That was lucky happenstance. So cool thing about this set is when I first got it, it only had about two or three of its original capacitors, the paper cap specifically, replaced by 60s era maroon drops. And I very acted up to see what would happen since the picture tube came back to life. And this set actually produced a really good picture when I first got it on nearly all original capacitors. As crazy as that is. I recapped it a few years ago. I occasionally run it. So now with two brighteners in series we are actually dropping voltage to the heater from what we had before. Eh, we'll just keep increasing brighteners and see uh, how far we can go before it drops below uh, the 6.1 volts we were getting before. So, power off. Next brightener, power back in. Okay, 4.8. 5.3 millivolts. What? So we now have three brighteners in series. Not sure where the camera cut out. We now have three brighteners in series. Um, yeah, this guy, this guy, this guy, straight to the CRT. And we are now down to 5.2 volts AC, which was lower than we started with. 
And the picture is very dim. So, putting brighteners in series usually doesn't work well. So as we can see in today's example, the second brightener didn't significantly increase the heater voltage. It was only, I think, about 0.1 volt. And the third brightener brought the heater voltage to the picture tube down below what it would normally get without any brighteners. Basically, brighteners are step-up transformers. Transformers are not 100% efficient and there are losses in transformers. And brighteners are only designed to handle the amount of current that the picture tube heater will draw from them. When you series string brighteners, the brightener closest to the picture tube will increase the current and load on the next brightener further, further away, and that brightener will increase the load on the next brightener further away, and what will quickly happen is that down the chain one to three brighteners, one of them will be trying to draw more power through a brightener than a brightener in the chain is able to deliver and the voltage will sag and you'll get this sad situation where currently the picture tube is being driven by 4.9 volts and is miserably, miserably dim. Okay, so that was your Brightener Madness Corner. Next up we work on swapping out the picture tube. So it occurs to me I never tested the picture tube to show how bad it is. So let's let's test the picture tube to show how bad it is. Okay. One of the nice things about my BNK 466 is that the main connector on it tests all the common monochrome picture tubes from post World War II up until the late 50s without any adapters. The main interface plug is actually configured to uh, test the 10BP4 base that just about all picture tubes used until the end of the 50s. Heaters adjusted to 6.3 volts and the tubes had plenty of time to warm up. I mean, it already is warm from the brightener experiments. We got no HK leakage, that's good. No G1 leakage, that's also good. We set G1 voltage almost always to that little green line at 45 volts. There are a few tubes that don't set it to that, but most tubes do. And then I have to set cutoff. Cutoff requires precision eyes. In this tester, you turn the cutoff knob up until you get a two division increase on the scale, which is basically a 2% increase on needle deflection. If you can't get that, the tube either has very weak emissions or very weak cutoff. If you turn the knob up and it shoots up to max, and no matter how delicately you turn the knob back down, you either get all or nothing, then the tube's badly gassy and won't work. Or occasionally your pots can be bad, but I haven't had a bad pot on this yet. So let's read a mission on this tube. And at 6.3 volts, this tube has... Wow. It has like 4% emission at 6.3 volts. That is... That is terrible. Yet it was producing a picture somehow. Do not ask me how it was doing that. Um, let's go back down to the heater adjustment and let's increase it from 6.3 that we were at to about 7.4 where the brightener had it. And let's wing it back to emission and see what it does. Almost 
almost 10% emission. Yeah, this tube is baked. And this focus is awful. Make sure to get you in closer on that. Yeah, that tube's baked. We're only getting, came up to about 12% emission. There's no, the emission scale really is only number seven that has good, bad, but I use number five, which is a G1 voltage scale, which goes from zero to 100 to give me essentially the percentage of quality on the tube. This tube is weak. Now, it is usable, but it's not great. The good bad scale I've found is accurate for color picture tubes. Color tubes, the shadow mask eats as much as 85% of the electron gun emissions, whereas 100% of electron gun emissions hit the phosphor and get converted into light in a normal monochrome tube, or at least very close to 100%. Um, so, on monochrome tubes with this tester, I found that 20 to 30 percent will normally give watchable picture without a brightener. It won't be, it won't be like watch it in a well lit room bright, but it's usable brightness. Once you're down below 20 percent, generally the tube is pretty darn tired and. You're not going to get much life out of it. This tube's definitely, it's definitely down there where you don't want it to be. And really, ideally, if you can, you want a black and white tube that tests in the good range, because then it'll be really good and bright. I've acquired a set that was very cheap, that I don't really want in my collection, that uses the same picture tube and tests up in the green. I'm going to pull the chassis on the Zenith, and then we will go and look at the set that I found as a CRT donor. Well, we may have lost the uh, time lapse of me removing the chassis bolts and not enjoying life doing that. Crouch down back here, but oh, instead film me trying to finagle the chassis out of a space much too small for that. Or not. Damn, I planned clearances good. Oh. So here's the chassis. Let me show something that'll break a lot of technicians' understanding of safe CRT handling and make them cringe. Always handle this tube by the neck and cone or by cone only. Never handle by that coating. Always handle this tube by the neck. I'm sure somebody out there is cringing really hard by that factory instruction sticker. Today on Poor Lighting Theater. This RCA console was the one in the truck from the TV haul video. This very beautiful looking uh, veneer is not veneer, it is photo finish. Which of course you can't see. Basically it's a water slide decal that uh, looks like really nice veneer that isn't and is placed over really cheap crappy wood. The top is real wood, a nice real wood, but the back third has a good amount of lacquer peeling and water damage. This RCA is not a porthole, but it uses the same picture tube as my porthole. And this was a $10 television. So I do not feel bad at all about yanking the picture tube out of this, putting it in my porthole, and putting the porthole CRT into this set and getting rid of this set for around what I paid. All 
also, as you can see, this set has no back. Which is another reason I do not feel bad about parting it out. I mean, someone else may actually put this together into a working set after I'm done with it. There's an RCA KCS 47 Resurrection video coming. Watch for it. If not, maybe the fish tankers will like it. I can't save them all. Sometimes you gotta buy part sets to make the stuff that you care about keep going. Takes the knobs off. Make the chassis easy to slide out. I, which will make the chassis easy to slide out once I get all the chassis bolts out. Um, you're kidding me. Chassis bolts are bigger than standard, and there's no screw heads. So what you're saying, RCA, is I need to go down and get a wrench and restart the video. Thanks. So I don't know when my camera cut out. Chassis is out. This particular set doesn't mount the picture tube to the chassis, but mounts it to the cabinet. So I have to do some goofy stuff. I have to hurry because. It's almost, it's almost bedtime today, and then tomorrow is the day before swap meet that I'm thinking about bringing this television to, because if I can sell this turkey at swap meet, because if I can sell this turkey to swap meet, here, I won't have to drag it an eight hour drive to Columbus, Ohio for the early television meet. <sighs> One of the mounting straps for the CRT isn't even installed. That is... That's quality right there. The capital K. And someone tightened the wing nut point where human hands couldn't uh, untighten it. Tom, you're a wing nut. Shut up. Grounding strap fell. That's nice. Okay, so... I just need to bunch the two nuts. And no, this is not sitting on the ground. It's sitting on a padded furniture dolly. Normally when you turn a set onto its face, you want to get like a blanket or something. I don't really have one of those here. So, the padded furniture dolly will... It'll do the job. Budge the other two nuts free. Or loose. And I can just finger loosen them the rest of the way with both hands at the same time. Semi ambidexterity, engage, nuts and washers. Now the. Oh! Ion trap. witness line tells me approximately where I want the ion trap to be. Okay. This picture tube's an Emerson picture tube. And I'm going to follow the instructions on the other picture tube saying, always pick up by the neck. Oh, this one has it too. 16 GP4B and it's a CBS. This is CBS. Okay, so this comes in the house, and then I'll show the testing. Okay, so the RCA tube is on the chair. The Zenith chassis is on the bench. Let's uh, turn on the bench so I have power for my picture tube tester and plunk the picture tube tester over there onto the tube. 
Okay, tripod camera battery dead. So, the following scene of me testing the replacement picture tube that I've scavenged for this set will be presented to you in shake vision on a cell phone camera. So, let's see here. All the knobs are set for minimum except for normalize, which is supposed to be set for maximum. Let's see here what's our heater voltage it's about five something let's get it up to the 6.3 mark like so that looks about right okay let's turn it on to hk leakage ain't got none g1 leakage ain't got none i already tested this tube before so i basically know what to expect from it. The first time I tested it was uh, asleep. I said G1 voltage right now. Um, sleeping sickness is something picture tubes will get when they have been sitting dormant for many, many years. Basically, picture tubes require a very, very high, near-perfect vacuum in order to function so that the electron beam from the electron gun can make it to the phosphor screen and illuminate it without I don't like the needle shadow okay let's just eliminate needle shadow and set it for Two divisions increase. Okay, cutoff is set for the two divisions increase that we want. Now we'll read emissions. And this tube is testing at about 74 right out of the gate, and it will probably warm up to. Possibly as high as 80. Now, sleeping sickness is something tubes get when they haven't been used in decades. Because they're under very high vacuum, they have this thing here called a getter. You see this kind of silvery stuff? If the silvery stuff ever turns white, the tube is completely vented down to air. Um, basically... The getter is here because the vacuum inside the tube is never completely perfect, and as the tube runs, it will gradually, as the tube runs and ages, it'll gradually release gas molecules inside the tube. The getter is here to soak those up. Well, the getter is basically highly reactive metal. What's the cathode of the electron gun that emits electrons to shoot to the face to light up the, the phosphor on the face. Well, the electron gun is also a highly reactive metal. And basically, when the electron gun sits for months or years or decades on end without emitting electrons, it acts as a getter and sucks up gas. And the gas that it sucks up will contaminate the surface layer of it to the point where it has a hard time emitting electrons. The saving grace, though, is that if you can get some electron flow going and get the heater heating up the cathode and the tube generally running a little bit, as it runs, it'll boil off all that gas contamination and return to being a functional cathode. While it's contaminated, it's in a state that TV collectors commonly refer to as sleeping sickness. Generally, if you just let the tube run on normal test settings, it will wake up from sleeping sickness in anywhere from 15 minutes to... In the case of the Zenith Coburg, I left it to sit for about two days, and it amazingly came back from being stone, stone, stone dead. The Zenith Coburg was so stone dead that when I bought it, I let it sit for about five or ten minutes, and I couldn't get any emission deflection out of it at all. This tube was asleep, but it came up over...
somewhere between two and eight minutes of runtime to the uh, good status it's in right now. And you can tell it's woken up pretty well because it came up to 70 immediately this time when I tested it. Whereas when I first plugged it in at the place I bought it from, it had almost no emission at all. But it came up over a couple of minutes. And it's still waking itself up a little bit after warm-up. You can see it's increased to about 83-ish. This thing's going to be good and bright. So I'm going to just clean the dust off the cone because that bugs me a little bit. And then I'm going to work on getting this installed into that chassis. Bell's nice and clean. Now on to the face. I suppose I could wait on the face till I get it installed, but I will just do it now. Get it done. Much better. Okay, I have no clue how much battery I got, so I'm going to try to do this picture tube swap as quick as reasonably possible. Socket. And the iron trap. And let's see here. Let's shroud loose. There's two quarter inch nuts that hold it. Hold both it and the uh, and the underscan overscan zoom switch thing. That's neat. Okay. Um, all right. Now we unhook the HV lead. It's been discharged a while ago. So it should be okay. Now this should just. like that. Uh, okay. So this is the new tube. That's right. This was mounted sort of like this in the RCA. that one into a hole. Let's get those screws in. Get the far one first. finger tight, which is good enough. My fingers are darn strong and I don't want to ruin the plastic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
just want to move it just a little bit more because I'm here. set. Okay. Let me, uh, let me get my cord. Come on, you crappy cheater cord, do stuff. No tube lights. So I figured out why it isn't powering up on the bench when I uh, plug it into my various uh, cheater cords, including my regular use one that I just magically found. Um, this is a two chassis Zenith. The second chassis, which contains the power supply, is back in the cabinet, and it's not connected right now. So, I gotta stick this into the cabinet in order to get anything out of it. Yes, I could bring the other power supply over, theoretically, but that cabinet has two other sets stacked on top of it, and it's very hard to get at the screws that mount the power supply chassis without turning the cabinet onto its side. So, that's a whole kettle of fish I don't want to get into. So instead, we're just going to pick this whole assemblage up and, and stuff it in the cabinet. to adjust the ion trap around the neck of the picture tube. It basically looks sort of like this. There are different shapes and styles, but you rotate it and you move it in and out, spin it all 360 degrees while watching the amount of light on the screen. Adjust it for maximum brightness. And if you're not getting great action out of your ion trap, flip it 180 degrees over and try it that way and spin it and move it back and forth and see if that improves. If it makes it worse, put it back to where it was before. Let's see if I got the ion trap crudely right on my first try. Okay, so the ion trap definitely isn't right. I don't need no audio. Stop talking back and... Let me adjust the ion trap. Do we have high voltage? We somehow don't. That's gonna make this less fun. Okay, we got 11 kilovolts of high voltage. There should be enough to run one of those tubes. Could reduce background lighting a little bit. Also, oh, there is some brightness. Okay, I can see something.
course it stops filming while I'm being victorious. So, the trap was pretty lousy before, so I flipped it 180 degrees over and put it back on, and now I've got a sweet spot. This is side to side. And this is back. This is forward. Okay, it is a lot brighter now. Ignore the RF multi-path interference. Brightness, that's maximum. That's minimum. Put it back to normal. Contrast is max there. And it's min here. Increase contrast till it's pretty nice and contrasting. Decrease brightness a little bit. That's looking really good compared to what it was before. I don't know how much battery life I have, but we'll try to give you a quick demonstration with some actual video. That means there are some things, and maybe a lot of things, that are unacceptable. We need to be proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And then uh, in the specific context of a local church, I think 1 John 4 verse 1 helps us when it says that we are to try the spirits, whether they be of God. Because many false prayer of church situations, decisions that have been made or are being made by... All right, I'm seeing some hands lifted up. Maybe you've experienced it in the past. Maybe a, a foolish, unwise decision was made that actually caused division and maybe even split a church. Have you ever heard like of... Like the Pope? Oh, I'm not supposed to say that, am I? The mother problems, Pope. Yeah, this set looks really good to me. Okay, so this is uh, the full screen zoom on the porthole, which stretches vertically, and this is the non-zoom, non-full screen mode on the porthole. Uh, this concludes the video. Please like and subscribe for more Vintage Electronics content. Thanks for watching.